To President Hollinger and the Board of Trustees, I'm very thankful indeed for your kindness and encouragement in extending to me this extraordinary honor today. Thank you very much. And to the graduating students of 2015, it's a great delight to join your professors and your friends and your family in congratulating you on your very significant achievement today. Congratulations. Well done. It is, of course, a very humbling and even intimidating experience to be invited to speak on such an occasion. I can actually remember the first time I was invited to speak at a university commencement and feeling myself just growing more and more nervous as the day drew near. I knew this was going to be a big deal. All the robes and parchments and parents with smartphones, this was <laughs> going to be a big deal. And I've never done this before, and so sensing the significance of the event, I convened an informal focus group of my colleagues there at International Justice Mission in the lunchroom. And they were all recent graduates of graduate education, and so I asked them earnestly, what do you most remember about your commencement speaker at graduation? And after due consideration, the answer came back unanimously. They all remembered absolutely nothing. <laughs> Feeling perhaps a little badly about this, they turned to me and asked me, well, what do you remember about your commencement speakers? The question, of course, provoked really wonderful memories of my outdoor commencements of my family being there, great friends being extraordinarily hot in a polyester black robe in the hottest day of the year. But when asked to focus on the words or even the identity of my commencement speaker, <laughs> I found my mind enter the most vast and empty warehouse imaginable where there were simply no memories upon the shelf. From my commencement speakers, I too could remember nothing. <laughs> and while troubling, at first, after a moment, this realization began to wash over me as the most profound sense of relief. In that moment, all nervous anxiety about what I might say was utterly swept away by the sweet and, and eternal certainty that no one was likely to recall a single word of it. So then what does one say when no one is likely to remember what you say? Well, to me, it seems quite clear that one says whatever they want. <laughs> and what I would like to say to you, the graduating students of Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary, is this. I want to urge you to enjoy your life. That's it. I urge you to relentlessly and uncompromisingly enjoy your life, and specifically to enjoy your life as a minister of the gospel in whatever vocation of ministry into which you now carry this very fine education. I feel a very great urgency in saying this because in 20 years of visiting and working with hundreds of churches, and walking with hundreds of pastors and Christian leaders, I must report with some sadness that I find many, maybe most, seem not to be really enjoying their lives. Not really deeply enjoying their lives. Which is perhaps why people in ministry don't seem to actually do it very long or why so many seem to be unable to finish well. Indeed, when they survey the spouses of those in ministry, 
those who, presum who presumably know and love them the best, they find in surveys by wide margins that those loving spouses wish their spouse in ministry did something else. Hundreds of men and women in ministry I've gotten to know over the decades do report being very, very busy. They're actually very well respected and even beloved, and people's lives have actually been transformed by their ministry. They've stayed faithful through the demands, and they do have more senior positions than they did and more responsibility now, and they are very busy. But, most, but do most of the people I've seen in ministry seem to overflow with deep lives of authentic joy? Not so much. On the other hand, I also have seen friends in ministry of all kinds, pastors, trauma counselors, spiritual directors, lay leaders, missionaries, government leaders, teachers, hospice workers, lawyers, fundraisers, scholars, and musicians, all in the ministry of the gospel in some way, who do lead lives of great, rich joy. Indeed, largely because I have gotten to have this experience of working in a Christian ministry, I have experienced more delight of soul and more gladness of heart than I ever could have imagined. And I am unspeakably grateful for that. Which is why I want to say to all of you, I hope you enjoy your life. I urge you to relentlessly and uncompromisingly enjoy your life. In fact, I ratchet up the weight and authority of my exhortation a little bit by even telling you that I think this is what God would like to say to you. Because contrary to a peculiar lie that has made its way into the world and even spilled over into ministry circles, the God who made us actually wants us to enjoy our lives. Indeed, as the psalmist declared thousands of years ago, in your presence, O God, there is fullness of joy. Indeed, Jesus, as we just heard, summed up the core purpose of all he had come to teach his disciples by saying, I've said all these things so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. But these kinds of Bible verses feel kind of empty, don't they? When we see the grim and dutiful weariness that seems to be grinding up Christ's ministers in the world, and I thought lawyers were dreary and bleak. <laughs> but as Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes reported to have said, I might have entered the ministry if certain clergymen I knew had not looked and acted so much like undertakers. <laughs> Indeed, my point is very modest. I simply believe that the God who created this beautiful day, who invented something like music, who, who made up the idea of, of having friends, that that God wants you to enjoy your life. Now, lest you think that I'm speaking of joy as some perpetual, thin giggle of existence, a thin giggle that's oblivious to what's hard in life and untouched by human suffering, I'd like to tell you what I think biblical joy is and where I've seen it. Perhaps the clearest and best definition I've seen of biblical joy comes from Dallas Willard, who simply says that divine, the divine grace of joy is a sensation of delight in a great good well secured. It's not a mere pleasure, but it is a sensation. Joy is something we can actually feel in our bodies and in our souls, an all-encompassing sense of well-being that brings deep and lasting delight. It's a delight that lifts the heart, it cheers the soul, it emotes in laughter and tears of happiness, in exultation, and in ineffable, unstoppable rejoicing of the Spirit. This is the joy of the Lord. But let me tell you also where I have seen it. 
I have seen it for nearly 20 years in my colleagues who work at International Justice Mission as they follow Jesus in the difficult work of justice, where every day they are confronting the violent forces that threaten to rape, assault, enslave, murder, torture, and abuse. And my colleagues have been kidnapped, attacked by mobs, targeted for assassination. They've been knifed and beaten and tortured. This is where I've seen that joy of which I am speaking. But it turns out that IJM's ministry is actually not a ministry primarily of dramatic danger. It's mostly a ministry of unglamorous, grinding hardship and tedium. It's loving the child victim of sex trafficking who sobs uncontrollably in a, feeble, in a fetal position from their abuse and then screams at you, strikes you, and curses you for months until she finally heals and finds resurrection through the power of unconditional love. It's the paralegal who spends 6,000 hours in a stifling, hot, and crowded Indian courthouse seeking the conviction of a single slave owner. Or the lawyer who spends days sleeping on the concrete floor of a police station just to make sure that the widow is protected from those who are coming with machetes. And in the midst of all this great suffering and evil and hurt, year in and year out, I see my colleagues manifest what Nehemiah described, that it is the joy of the Lord that is our strength. My colleagues, they constantly joke and tease. They rejoice and feast. They party and dance. They play and sing. They delight in their children. They stand in awe before beauty. They're generous with affection. They're unguarded in their earnestness. And they frequently just laugh themselves together to tears. Of course, my brothers and sisters at IJM are also flawed and human and silly and we're stupid and broken. But this just makes God's sense of humor all the more irresistible for the very idea that he would use such common and flawed instruments to do his grand work of justice in the world. That's such a silly joke as to keep us from even ever being grim. In my personal experience, this kind of joy is actually possible for you and me, but it's certainly not inevitable. So we might ask for just a moment, well, what are the forces that end up destroying joy? It's not a mysterious list, actually, of things. It's things that have been known for thousands of years. And usually topping that list are these things, fear exhaustion, guilt, relational barrenness, and lack of purpose. Now there's nothing on this list that applies necessarily pe peculiarly for ministry, but I do think there's one element on this list that seems most unnecessarily threatening of the joy of those in Christian ministry, and that is exhaustion. And this makes sense, right? Because ministry is a pouring out. It's an offering of ourself in service. But at some point, we find ourselves simply done, just empty, spent, exhausted. And at some point, the vessel simply fails. It has no more to give, and there is no joy. Why is that? At IJM, we find that exhaustion comes when we forget that the work of justice, for instance, is God's work. When we're tempted to think slowly but subtly that the work actually comes from us and ultimately prevails only through us. And we forget that the work is His and that He invites us to the work primarily for the joy of getting to do it with us. I always picture the way when my kids were really little, they always wanted to help out with the jobs around the house, right? When they're little, not when they grow up, but when they're little. And they love this, right? And they're never actually all that helpful, but they say, Dad, can we help? And, you know, a good dad will say, well, of course you can help. And they come in and they mess everything up, but they're helping, right? 
because they just want to be part of adult things and more than anything else they want to be with their dad but over time working in the garden with the dad the little one just wanders off into his own corner and he starts to get frustrated feels far from his dad and overwhelmed and just banging his little hoe into the hard ground and the father's calling over come over what are you doing over there you're not even supposed to. it's too hard oh come on over here but the the child's not even listening anymore full of self-pity now and hurt and pride that is wounded and far from the father we get lost when we wander from the idea that the work is his and the whole idea of the work every day is to do it with him. Likewise, we can find trouble as we begin to lose sight of the Father in whatever the ministry is that he is giving us. The vessel fails because we're no longer allowing God to pour into us. Over time at IJM, we have found really one simple thing that helps perhaps the most to make sure that we are close to him so he can pour into us. And this radical secret thing is this. We talk to him in prayer, in daily rhythms of prayer. Every day at IJM, everyone gets paid for a half hour of doing nothing at all. It's called 8.30 stillness, and we just sit absolutely silently and simply prepare spiritually in prayer from 8.30 till 9. Then at 9 o'clock, we work for two solid hours. Then at 11 o'clock, everyone stops, and we gather again for another half hour of prayer together. Once a quarter, we stop work for an entire day to pray together, and then once a year, we gather all of our intercessors together for several days of prayer with our leaders. All of this and other spiritual disciplines are an attempt to stay close to the God of justice who must pour into us in order that we might pour out in service. In a violent world parched with hopeless despair, God offers to perform the very same miracle he did with that widow of Zarephath in providing for Elijah that vessel of oil that did not fail. And as we stay close to him in prayer, he is the one who does the pouring in. We also have found that we have to stay very intentional in guarding our joy with disciplines of recreation and refreshment and celebration, even making simple laughter a priority of our life together. As Dallas Willard has observed, the first thing to disappear when spiritual health disappears is laughter. Finally, we must aggressively and intentionally guard our joy in ministry. Why must we guard it? Because joy is the pure oxygen that makes it possible for our ministry to endure through great struggle and sorrow. Indeed, if we neglect our joy, we shut ourselves off from the very life of our spirit. In the absence of joy, the heart grows sick. It lacks the strength to endure hardship and, consol and it lacks the consolations of gladness and beauty and the darkness rolls in. It is the tiresome but predictable assault of our adversary who wants to shut us off from joy. And one of the most powerful ways he does this is by making us feel guilty about enjoying our lives. It works like this, in our ministry of service, You'll be exposed to great suffering and brutality and hurt in other people. And a little voice will say, with so much suffering in the world, who are you to be enjoying your life? Who are you to laugh, to play, to dance, to feast, to fool around? Shame on you. It's powerful even as we hear it, right? And what an ingenious scheme of our adversary to make us feel guilty for breathing oxygen. Oxygen is good. God made it for us, and he created us in such a way that we're supposed to take it in continuously. Likewise, joy is good. God surrounds us with it in the world. And like the flight attendant just told me as I was flying in yesterday, please secure your own oxygen source. 
before assisting others. Joy is the oxygen of our obedience and service to Jesus. There may be some who get so fussy with their own oxygen mass that they never get around to attending to others, but I don't think that actually is what tempts most of us. Rather, the life of ministry is a marathon, not a sprint. And wisdom in securing your own steady supply of godly joy will secure a legacy of ministry that will not fail. And by the grace of an infinite and generous God, you're invited to thoroughly enjoy your life to the praise and glory of your joyful Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.